Um, the question I wanted to ask was this. In the two years, uh, in the years before the coalition government, uh, a very significant amount of money came to the sector um, in the form of, uh, of hubs and capacity builders and future builders and so on, including quite a large slice to, um, to Stuart's uh, organization. And on the face of it, that ought to have put the sector in a, in a good position to have the capacity to deal with some of the strains now being put upon it. So I'd be interested in the views of the panel as to, as to what good came uh, from that very significant amount of public expenditure and what sustainable outcomes are now are, uh, arising from it. Lord Wallace, is there any sustainable legacy from significant investment during the Labour years? I, yes, there is a certain amount. I, just let me say, however, um, I think part of the problem of the, the contract relationship between the public sector and the community sector was that uh, a, a lot of voluntary organisations got over-dependent on contract. The charities I'm aware of in, in, in West Yorkshire, one or two of them have been badly hit, particularly by MOJ cuts. Um, and um, I, I'm very well aware of how painful some of those have been. One or two of them, however, uh, have been partly self-funding through generating income from some of their own activities, and they have been much less badly affected by this. Now, I, I happened to be looking uh, the other week at uh, one of the areas in which there has already been um, community asset transfer into a community association which is able therefore to raise some of its own revenue from its own activities, that seems to be part of a better model, less dependence on public contracts, which I hope we will be moving further towards. Lord Hodgson, you don't speak uh, for the government, you're not part of the government, you're a, a Conservative peer in the Lords. Do you want to say anything on your view of uh, the question? Only I think, only I think this, that um, when well, I think I see David Tyler in the audience there. Uh, he and I and some others reported, did our Unshackling Good Neighbours report. One of the things that the vault sector found very difficult was the barriers in the commissioning process, that uh, charities find it hard to deal with the diverse and difficult and often conflicting demands of, of commissioners in various parts of the government machine. Um, in particular that uh, often the number of tenderers was very great in relation to the size of the contract being awarded. Very often the cost of tendering, when there could only be one win winner, was very great or too great. And very often the cost of monitoring the process uh, was very great. And worst of all, very often in the middle of the, of the contract, the basis for monitoring was changed. And I think both those things, all those things were unhelpful to the sector and could, as you know, Andrew, also have been on that task force, uh, could be tackled and should be tackled. And I hope are being tackled. Thank you, uh, Robin. Stuart, um, this is one of the narratives that you recounted the partnership to narrative. us, the partnership yeah, no. narrative from 97. Yeah. I mean, did it do any good? Well, I mean, uh, Chris's question was particularly about capacity building, I think. But, but, but I think it's more wide than that. You know, w what was the lasting legacy? Um, I think in philanthropy there was a lasting legacy. I think the reduction of gift aid threshold to zero by the, the then Chancellor uh, has produced a stream <coughs> of money which wouldn't otherwise have been there. Uh, I think the compact still has value, particularly at a local level, where it actually frames partnership working quite well uh, and has been used fairly effectively. Um, I think that in terms of capacity building uh, and infrastructure support, um, I think there is some evidence that the investment in uh, advice and information, which is essentially what that was, it was about providing training, advice and support for people in a variety of areas, did improve the capacity of organisations principally small to medium-sized organisations. Large organisations tend to buy that capacity in the marketplace anyway. Small to medium-sized organisations can't. There's some evidence that that's true. But I think uh, since that period, uh, two, three, three things have happened in relation to infrastructure. The first is where possible infrastructures start to thought, think about earned income 
as an alternative source in order to sustain itself. Secondly, there is the beginnings of, and I think there will be the continuation of, the rationalisation of infrastructure. 45 strategic partners was a bit odd, in my view. It didn't sound particularly strategic. And I, and I think, it, it, in some ways, the lack of public money is causing organisations to collaborate more, uh, and even in some cases to merge, which I think is, is useful. But I think, interestingly and more significantly in a way, the way in which we provide capacity building is actually changing. It has to be done in a different way. And just I'll close on this point. But the first is that this has to be more technology-based, that actually um, it, 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 the traditional model of capacity building, which is I've written the book, come to the conference, I'll tell you how to do it, go away and do it, is not the only way of doing this. And we're seeing, we're developing now platforms. We, we merge with Know How Nonprofit, for example, um, that are actually are about peer-to-peer -peer learning on electronic platforms, which I think is going to be the shape of capacity building in the future. So I think there is some lasting legacy from it, but I think the lack of public money has meant that we've had to adapt the way in which we provide, uh, we provide support in the future. I'm going to come to Gareth Thomas uh, in a moment, but would anyone in the audience like to... Uh, give a perspective or a comment on the labour years? Is there a sustainable legacy that we can see? And if so, where do we look for it? Um, so Roger Singleton there, I see. Uh, and a question at the front as well, please. Any? Uh, so Roger. Hello. It, it, it doesn't actually follow your interpretation there, Chair. It picks up on Chris Kelly's specific question about capacity builders. I was a director of, of capacity builders, and I think the direct answer to Chris's answer it was that, is that it was mixed. And the question that was left, certainly in my mind, was to ask the extent to which funding, if I may say so, national and regional and sub-regional infrastructure bodies actually facilitated and helped charities at the front line. I don't think we ever really uh, bottomed that one. Right. Um, yes, I'll take the gentleman there. Sorry. Would you like to say who you are and where you're from, yeah, please? Peter Lewis, Chief Exec of the Institute of Fundraising. And I always find the voluntary sector doesn't do itself its proper service when it talks too much just about itself for the sake of itself. And for me, this discussion is about... You know, the, I've worked in the public sector and I've worked in the voluntary sector and really with, there's a shared agenda around public benefit and serving our respective beneficiaries, whether that's around poor people or whether that's making the environment better. And for me, therefore, the question is really how you get the relationship between the public sector and the voluntary and community sector, both of whom should be serving their beneficiaries, the communities that we jointly share... <coughs> in the best way and it's getting the best balance between that relationship and really therefore you should judge that by how well communities are doing not about the, the health of the voluntary sector or the health of the public sector but by levels of poverty how good the environment is because they're agendas that we're working on together so I think it's it's just dangerous thinking about the sector for itself rather than thinking about the levels of po poverty or the levels of inequality in society, which is surely what all of us are about, whether it's public sector or voluntary and community sector. So, Gareth Thomas, you've, you've heard the other uh, panellists. You've heard one or two comments from the floor. What do you say about is there a sustainable legacy from these years? I suppose I'd answer that um, question by um, pointing to one particular example of a charity that did benefit from... Um, Future Builders funding. It's called Cambridge House. It's based in um, in Southwark, and uh, it received a grant which enabled it to significantly upgrade um, its buildings, um, which at the time hel helped it to put on a series of additional facilities for the um, local community, and which now, um, in the uh, more difficult funding environment that they find them, themselves uh, in, has allowed um, them, because of the size of the premises they have to bring in a whole series of other charities, far smaller charities, to be based in the um, centre, providing income um, to um, Cambridge House for its activities, but also helping those other very local, much smaller communities to continue um, to survive. 
And so I think in that, um, in that very obvious um, example, there was real benefit and still a sustained um, benefit for um, that particular charity. If you were in power now and you had the 13 years all over again, what would you do differently as far as civil society is concerned? Um, I, th I mean, I think there are some issues about um, commissioning um, and um, commissioning still not being um, easy enough for um, community groups, in particular the smaller charities, um, to have access to. I think that's one thing um, where there's still work to do. The government are looking at it. I think we have more uh, work to do as a party to think about how do you really get genuinely fair markets um, for um, charities um, to participate in when they're competing against um, against the private sector. There are certainly issues around um, around red tape um, where we could make it easier. And I think in that context, as I've said, the small donations bill is quite interesting um, in um, in that in that sense. Um, so those are one or two of the issues that um, I think with hindsight we could have done um, slightly differently and where, you know, as part of some of the discussions that Tessa Jow and Roberta Blackman Woods, my predecessor, have been leading on, we have sought to learn some of those lessons by talking to the sector.